All right. Uh, hi, everyone. A very warm welcome to this live virtual session. My name is Jerry, and I'm part of the People Matters team, and I'm your host for today. Uh, so we are here to talk about background screening, right? So with the rise of new digital technologies, how background screening process is transforming uh, is changing. And according to a higher rights survey in 2023, 86% of respondents from India said that they found employment discrepancies in their background screening processes. And 43% of them said these are commonly found education discrepancies. So despite the lack of digital public records, nine in 10 employers from India utilize background screening processes that uh, conduct all of these education checks and employment checks in a manual way. And three quarters of the respondents from India said that speed was a very important factor in choosing uh, a screening provider for background screening. So we're going to unpack this topic a little bit more. And we are so glad that you took the time to join us today. We had some phenomenal uh, number of registrations. And we're excited to introduce our speakers who will shed light on uh, important aspects of this process. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome Ko Huyen, uh, who is the Higher Rights Senior Vice President and Managing Director for Asia Pacific. She's responsible for plotting Higher Rights strategic growth across the region. And prior to Higher Right, uh, Huyen served in multiple senior leadership roles at organizations, including ESI International. Great to have you with us, Huyen. Hi, Jerry. Happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, we also have with us Caroline Smith, who is a VP for Deputy General Counsel. And Caroline is a UK qualified lawyer with over 20 years of experience. And she's been with the Higher Right Group for 15 years. And she leads the international legal function as a Deputy uh, General Counsel with a special focus on privacy and compliance. Great to have you with us, Caroline. Yeah, great to be here. We also have with us Samrat Das, who is uh, the VP for APAC and US offshore operations. And Samrat is responsible for building and driving uh, the operational functions to meet customer expectations while implementing continuous improvement processes and encouraging sustainable growth and stability. Great to have you with us, Samrat. Thank you, Jerry. Hello, everyone. Fantastic. So. Uh, before we jump into the discussion today, I think we have a number of focus areas that we want to talk about, but we also want to hear from you. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions, observations, or concerns, uh, feel free to share it with us at any time during this conversation. We also have a dedicated Q&A time at the end of this discussion where we'll take up our audience questions, and we'd like to hear some of the challenges that you are facing on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Yeah. All right. So with that, uh, we'll jump into our panel discussion. And I want to also sort of first ask uh, all of our panelists, you know, what are some of the, the key trends and developments in this space, right? We are observing a greater increase in digitization, a number of automated processes that are coming in across the employee life cycle. And, and, and we're seeing background screening also change as a result of it. So um, if all of you can sort of weigh in on this question, I want to start with Huyen, and then we'll uh, go to the others. Right. Thanks, Jerry. So before we start diving into what are the key trends that we're seeing, uh, let's just first understand background screening in India. So historically, background screening in India has relied very heavily on manual processes. And this is because unlike smaller countries like Singapore, where it is relatively easy to digitize personal data and records, it is quite a mammoth task for India. Being the most populous country in the world, many records in India have yet to be digitized or are currently going through the digitization process. So what this means is that for background screening, many checks will still need to be conducted physically. So for example, to verify uh, an address in India, the BGV company will typically need to do a site uh, visit in person. This additional manual step extends the turnaround time for checks and sometimes increases the unable to verify rates in India 
compared to other locations where there is easier access to digitized uh, records. However, we are currently seeing a move towards automation. Some of these legacy manual processes may no longer align with the new automated systems. The shift away from these manual processes is a consequence of digitization and automation of records as well as access points. So as an example, the Indian government has started linking data to an individual's at her identity or number. The way that data records in India are accessed uh, has also evolved over recent years, and we continue to see that happening. This is something we expect to gain momentum in years to come as it's more and more records get digitized. And this will help and also enable background screening providers to automate much more of their verification process and also build integrations across their systems with government databases. And one key benefit from this is that it will reduce turnaround time without compromising on the quality of the checks. Something we continue to see in our higher rights own research is that employers in APEC, especially in India, are often finding discrepancies between the information provided by their candidates on their job application forms or resumes and what is being verified during their pre-employment background check. In fact, our Higher Rights 2023 Global Benchmark Survey, which Jerry uh, alluded to earlier, we surveyed over 2,000 HR, risk, and talent management professionals globally, what we found is that 86% of participants from India say that uh, employment verifications were among the most common checks to have discrepancies. This is a figure that's up from 71% in the previous year. And I think worth noting also is that these figures in India were the highest globally. So the rise of digitization of records in India and the reported increase in the number of employers from India finding candidate discrepancies during the screening process highlight the urgent need for businesses to proactively look at their background screening processes to close any potential gaps and where possible replace time-consuming manual processes with automated ones. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that um, outline, Huya. And I think you also outlined the uh, external and internal shifts that is prompting businesses and governments also to uh, move towards automation. Caroline, I want to come to you next. Uh, what are some of your thoughts and observations here? Yeah, so picking up on the employment discrepancies that Huyen just mentioned and that are being reported via our survey, one trend that we're certainly seeing, and, and I think this is a trend that's been expedited by the COVID-19 pandemic, is that companies in India are increasingly using background screening to identify and address moonlighting. Moonlighting itself has become more prevalent within, uh, within the um, employment market. Now, background screening companies typically check for evidence of moonlighting by searching for public records or using social media profiles, and then of course, contacting previous employees and references. But that can actually be a little bit hit and miss um, and isn't 100% reliable. But what we're now seeing with the introduction of automation and digitization is that we've got further capabilities. So for example, we can verify employment through sources such as the Universal Account Number or the UAN, um, which is the Provident Fund information. Now that represents a revolutionary shift and it eliminates a lot of manual processes and also reduces uncertainties associated with employment verification. And that's, of course, hugely beneficial to anybody hiring those individuals. Now, that innovation is being supported in India from a legislative standpoint, and we definitely need to consider India's new Digital Privacy Act and the Indian government's clear emphasis on artificial intelligence, which is poised to become another significant trend and development in the business context. When we examine the specific developments that will reshape how background screening operates, it's evident that digitization and the new legislation plays a pivotal role and there are two key facets to consider in this regard. Firstly, of course, digitization offers the obvious advantage of improved record keeping, which is undeniably beneficial and facilitates streamlined access through linkages. Secondly, legislation and digitization better protects individuals' data, and that provides greater comfort to those individuals when they go through a screening process. 
However, of course, there's always a flip side and the flip side of digitization lies in its use by the government to enhance data security. Now, this is translating into, at the moment, an increased complexity in accessing data that was previously easily obtainable for background screening companies. What we're seeing are extra security measures, such as one-time passwords or OTP codes being introduced, and they can present barriers um, to screening companies. And those screening companies need to start to consider how to use additional technologies to access that information. For example, approved APIs directly into those sites. And again, the legislation supports the use of that technology. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for getting in depth uh, into the, the, the legal aspects uh, also that is changing. Uh, Samrat, what are your thoughts and observations on this theme? Yeah, uh, you know, as Huyen and Caroline has uh, touched upon some really key points uh, on this, I think the, you know, the whole uh, effort of Indian government to digitize various records have been going on for quite some time. Uh, you know, whether we look at the police records or the ID checks or, you know, uh, the PF details, you know, the Indian government has been taking a lot of efforts to digitize. I mean, uh, even e-codes, uh, you know, today there's a lot of data available and, uh, you know, you can do a lot of uh, criminal record verification through e-codes. Uh, traditionally, you know, the HR leaders or, or most of the organizations in India uh, were not so keen on getting verifications, you know, done through the online sources. But as, you know, uh, does these data sources have been becoming more reliable, uh, we can see a shift. And, uh, you know, a lot of HR leaders and organizations today, uh, you know, want to use these data sources, the online sources for uh, completing the verifications because one, you know, it, it is a lot more quicker and uh, even the accuracy levels are, you know, higher when you uh, use these data sources for completing the verification. Uh, now, the key aspect uh, that we have seen in the last four or five years in India is about, you know, linking uh, an individual's uh, data uh, with the unique identification number, the Aadhaar uh, number, right? And what it means today is, uh, you know, whether you want to uh, get a mobile connection or you want to open a bank account, uh, as long as you have an Aadhaar number, you know, it's very easy to track uh, your details. And that's another, you know, major, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing that we have seen in in the Indian, uh, uh, you know, digitization world. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, the background check, I think, uh, you know, if if we are looking at accessing sources or records which are a lot more digitized, uh, you know, one it definitely, you know, look takes care of the turnaround time. As you mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, employers and uh, you know organizations, they look at turnaround time as one of the important factors. And in addition to turnaround time, you know, accuracy is also uh, very important when it comes to choosing a screening partner. So, you know, these data sources definitely help in terms of a quicker turnaround time, as well as uh, you know, takes care of any kind of errors that can take place due to human intervention. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Samrat. Uh, Huyen, I'm coming to you next. Um, you know, uh, and just taking off of what uh, Samrat was talking about, if you could also maybe deep dive into how this shift is going to mitigate some of the issues that uh, HR leaders face and, and what are the new opportunities that really should be on top of the mind for HR leaders who are thinking about this? Uh, if you could talk about that shift. Yeah, sure. So I think there are several advantages and uh, through it, it presents opportunities as we transition to digital processes, right? Some of this include uh, efficiency and uh, time savings consistency and accuracy, compliance, assurance, and improved candidate uh, experience. So the first two factors or uh, advantages that I mentioned on efficiency and time savings, right? Uh, it is, uh, as well as consistency and accuracy, I would say this are uh, uh, kind of interlink. Currently, some customers uh, still expect us to have manual human intervention even before the candidate submits documentation for their background check. 
So for example, they may want us to do a pre-check for discrepancies or insufficiencies where uh, identifying where their company requirements are not met rather than allowing the automated process to take care of this work. And some customers uh, also do not want to engage with our system directly to access uh, data on their company's uh, screening program and reporting. Instead, they want uh, their BGV partner to download the data into an Excel uh, spreadsheet, fill up customized fields, organizing the data manually, right? This is, I think, something that uh, people have been used to doing for a while. Unfortunately, this uh, really increases the chance of errors with a lot of uh, data uh, that's manually inputted. And it also causes uh, a situation where recruiters will need to take more time to digest the information. So if we have automation through a screening platform like our proprietary platform in higher right, it really removes the need for these manual processes, which not only enhances uh, speed, but elevate accuracy and reducing the margin for human error in the process. And we mentioned this earlier, right? And uh, we saw this from our 2023 Global Benchmark Survey that over uh, close to three quarters of respondents in India uh, identify speed as the most, uh, one of the most important factor when they're choosing a screening provider. And over half uh, cited accuracy of results as uh, being highly important to them. The third advantage uh, that we can look at is compliance assurance. If companies choose the right BGV partner to partner with, they can rely on the BGV uh, partner's online platform and storage for data retention and protection. With the new Digital Personal Data Protection Act uh, 2023, it is very important for companies operating in India to ensure that they adhere to these stipulated requirements. And partnering with a BGV company that not only understands, but adapts well to these evolving requirements is key. Greater automation in the screening process in India also provides HR leaders the opportunity to align their screening practices to those that are already adopted in many other different countries. This alignment creates consistency and enables uh, HR leaders to have data-driven, accurate reporting of their program performance. And this is especially critical as we see more and more MNCs moving the management and administration of their background screening programs to India. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Huyan, for sharing that. I think you also outlined, uh, you know, what are the advantages of working with a partner uh, in this space and how they can sort of bring that expertise uh, to ease that process. So. If we were to think about this entire process from a candidate perspective, right, and uh, and we're talking about the advantages for the business, but how can we sort of think about the advantages from a candidate perspective and how can this uh, implemented automated strategy uh, really improve their experience? Um, Car Caroline, can we hear your thoughts on this first? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's safe to say, I mean, by, by the people that are on the panel today, you know, background screening doesn't always come top of people's favourite hobbies or pastimes. Um, so the way that, that really we want to approach this is to try and remove the friction for the candidate. Um, so we're always trying to think about what are the candidate's expectations when they enter into any type of processing of their data? And I think it's really safe to say that today's candidates are much more aware than ever about the importance of data protection and privacy. And this translates into those high expectations about how the data is processed and used. Now, if we look at how that then melds into background screening, what this equates to is security of data, accurate reporting of data and quick results. And I think in each case, automation is a real essential tool in achieving all of those things. It reduces human error for manual data entry. You can utilize APIs to assist in the secure exchange of data. You can use automation tools. They can help determine accurate results. But you can also use AI, for example, in name matching or exclusion of results using things like NLP. And of course, as we've mentioned, automation does equate to quicker results. Now, that's always going to be beneficial to a candidate. They want to get hired as quickly as possible. And I think in addition, candidates are now aware of privacy legislation and trends in this area. 
So in India, I do think it can be expected that candidates are aware of the new laws that have just been implemented that relate to that digitization and automation. So if any human resource team can actually partner with screening providers that build those privacy concepts into the design of their systems and processing, it's a huge win in gaining the confidence of candidates that are actually subject to that screening process. Absolutely. Uh, Samrat, would you like to add your thoughts to this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, adding to what Caroline has said, I think the the applicant population today is, you know, a lot more aware and educated population. I mean, they know about, you know, uh, how their data should be used and how it's important to ensure that, you know, the data that they share is secured. Because, you know, when, when a screening partner is asking for data, there's a lot of sensitive uh you know data personal information that's being asked from an applicant right so having a platform or work if if an employer is working with a screening company that has a really secured and automated platform what it means for the applicant is that you know their data is not uh you know the, the chances of data theft is really less right and their data is totally secured they'll not be bothered or buffed uh, after they have shared the data, uh, you know, in I mean, few years back, maybe ten or fifteen years back, you know, some the data used to be collected in paper, and you know, I I recollect as an applicant when I used to fill my data on a paper form, I used to be always worried that you know, whose hand will it go to, and you know how that is going to be used. But when you have a, a screening partner, you know, who has a really secure platform and you know the data is collected on that platform so as an applicant you feel a lot more uh, you know relaxed about sharing your data uh, you know as per high rights uh, global ben survey of 2023 almost 61 percent of the respondents in india said that uh, they use an uh, applicant tracking system and 54 percent uh, you know that's that's like up from 54 percent that we had in the 2022 survey and around 59 percent of those said that uh, you know their uh, ads is integrated uh, with their screening provider so i think that's where we see how important it is to one have a ads and to ensure that you know you have that integrated with your screening partner right another advantage of having a secured or an automated uh, system for an applicant is that uh, you know you I mean, traditionally, there has been, uh, you know, a lot of email exchanges that happen either with the employer or applicant and they are, you know, they're expected to share documents over email. Uh, when you have a proper ADS or a screening system, an applicant can use, uh, you know, can log into that system and upload their data rather than uh, sending it out uh, uh, on, on emails, you know, through uh, publicly accessible uh, email ID. So I think that's where, again, you know, having uh, a robust and a, a, you know, secure platform helps a lot and makes the applicant feel a lot more secure. Fantastic. That's, that's great. I think uh, you mentioned the points that also sort of brings the confidence of the candidate uh, in the process and that they don't have to worry so much about uh, how their data is being used. Uh, Hui and what are your thoughts on this on this theme? So one of our primary goals uh, at Higher Rights when we deal with candidates is that we want to ensure that candidates experience the smoothest uh, journey as they go through the background screening process. Uh, it should be unintrusive and they should feel very comfortable uh, throughout. So there are several areas where automation can help improve the candidate experience during the life cycle of a background check. So from the time we trigger the request to uh, the candidate submitting his or her information for screening to helping the candidate to fill up information and upload it into uh, an applicant uh, portal. I think that's where we can have uh, automation helping, right? And we can definitely uh, pre-populate uh, data. So data pre-population will reduce duplicate data entry, uh, reduces the hassle for candidates. It speeds up time for hiring for candidates whenever employers use an applicant tracking system and if it's integrated with their screening provider. 
And on that note, right, just uh, to highlight, Higher Right offers over 70 ATS integrations with many of the world's leading providers, including Workday, Success Factors, Oracle, and uh, Liver. So from a candidate's uh, perspective, right, uh, more automation in the background screening process will result in a more streamlined and hassle-free screening experience. And it also gives them the confidence and certainty around how their information and data will be treated. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that way. And so we've spoken so much about you know the benefits of automation we've spoken so much about the advantages of engaging in this process for not just the business but also the candidates um, but one of the fears that people have of course is that is this a foolproof process um, of course no process can really be foolproof but uh, you know it, is this something that is maybe compromising on quality uh, and how do you strike a balance between fast turnaround times and maintaining high quality because speed is ultimately a crucial factor, right? When uh, selecting a screening provider for many employers. Um, Samrat, what do you think of this challenge and how, how can HR leaders really think about uh, the benefits and the, uh, you know, the, the need for high quality as well? Yeah, I think, Jerry, you have touched upon a very important and crucial factor, you know, in, in this uh, discussion. Uh, so if if we look at you know we uh, the global benchmark survey that Hyatt right did uh, you know in 2023, almost 50 percent of the participation uh, participants from India said that they saw you know uh, they they expect the recruitment processes to become more efficient and that's you know that's one of their uh, most significant you know uh, challenges uh, when it comes to talent acquisition right. And uh, forty-eight percent expect this to be, uh, you know, uh, a major challenge maybe for next two to three years. Uh, while you know most of the employers want their candidate uh, screening results quickly, uh, you know most are willing, uh, most are really not willing to sacrifice you know quality and accuracy because that's that's you know really really important uh, you know in 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 the screening uh, industry, right? You not only do you want your candidate to be screened quickly, but you even want it to be done accurately, right? If you're not uh, able to, if you're doing, if you're compromising on either one, uh, then, you know, you're not doing a good job in terms of screening. And at higher right, uh, you know, we place a lot of uh, emphasis in terms of maintaining, uh, you know, high quality standards. Uh, we have a lot of processes in place to ensure that there's a good quality check being done uh, before you know the results or the reports are shared uh, with the clients and uh, you know we i mean you know we see speed and uh, you know precision uh, as essential components of any screening program right and without that we just don't you know deliver the results back to the customer uh, we are, uh, you know, in terms of looking at making our platforms a lot more smarter, uh, you know, looking at uh, various integrations to make our uh, processes quicker, faster, and, uh, you know, uh, look at making sure that we are uh, not having too much of human intervention, which will then lead to high quality uh, standards as well and high accuracy, right? And what's important uh, is while we are investing in, automation you know if we continue to have uh, processes uh you know which are manual from the customers end then you know for we are not able to see those uh, gains in terms of efficiency because you know no matter how much automation we do at the back end but if we have a lot of manual uh, processes from the clients and then somewhere you know uh, we don't see those uh, that uh, or the turnaround time gains right so i think that's that's another thing that we really need to focus on uh in terms of uh, you know the databases as i spoke earlier that you know there's a lot of uh, emphasis uh, that the government also has put in in terms of you know uh, digitization of databases and open apis which are meant for integration so that you know we are able to uh, 
deliver accurate results and uh, you know faster results as well right uh, one example that i can think of you know being in this industry for the last uh, 12 to 13 years is uh, you know in 2010 11 when i started working in this industry uh, the police check process uh, in india was a, you know extremely manual process uh, which included uh, you know the applicant visiting the local police station and sometimes it took it not only was it a painful process for the applicant and the client it was you know a pretty lengthy process as well it used to take you know more than 20 days to get this uh, criminal check or the police check done and that's when you know that around that time the whole e courts uh, you know the initiative of e courts started uh, by the indian government and today we know that most of the clients prefer doing uh, the e court checks uh, you know because one it's a lot quicker and you know you can look at building api integrations with e courts which helps in terms of you know a, a more accurate results as well right so that's one thing that i can uh, really think of how the industry has changed uh, maybe in last uh, you know uh, uh, 10 to uh, 12 years or so and as i mentioned earlier you know what's really important is to have not only a, a quicker turnaround time but you know delivering results with precision as well and, and i think that's where high right is unique from a lot of other players uh, you know in this market absolutely thank you so much uh, samrat for sharing that i think it's not just a, a technology process but really a systemic and an ecosystem change that sort of fueling uh, the speed so i think uh, it's a very balanced perspective uh, carolyn i'm coming to you next um, I, on a point that you highlighted a little earlier um you know as india prepares to implement this uh, digital personal data protection act uh what are the new implications for hr leaders uh, when integrating automation into background screening and how can they really ensure that this adoption is meeting the regulatory requirements yeah so um well, the law is obviously my favorite topic and um i have to say the digital personal data protection act is one of my top favorite um new acts um to come into force um and it received official assent on the 11th of august though the go live dates um should be noted by everybody are going to be notified to us in due course and it's expected that different parts of the legislation will come into effect at slightly different times now as i said this is incredibly exciting and actually the acts garnered a lot of attention from data protection authorities around the world and has been much lauded by the norwegians the south africans and also in europe as well and i think the the data protection authorities are actually learning quite a lot from this new law so so it's it's super exciting that that uh, india is at the vanguard of of the new sort of generation of privacy laws now if we're looking at how hr teams can prepare I think let's split this into two portions your day job and then let's look specifically at background screening. So looking at the day job to start with um much like any journey that you'll have to comply with new legislation HR leaders at the moment should start conducting their audits around their record keeping practices and ensuring that they draw a clear line between records that are kept online versus those that are kept on paper. In addition, um HR leaders also need to review tools they're using in recruitment processes. That's to see if any of those tools introduce automation into any selection or screening process. And also review your vendors that you work with. So that can include ATS vendors as well who may process that personal data as part of the services that are being provided. Now, the reason we've drawn out those examples is that it's really important to remember that the act only applies to online data and automated processing. So your audit is going to be critical so that you can identify what you need to, you know, what data is subject to the new law. And once that audit is complete, you should then review your processes against those requirements laid down in the act to ensure compliance and also prepare data maps. Data maps are people's best friend when it comes to complying with these new provisions. Now linking this at a really high level to the background screening process your background screening vendor will of course be processing personal data so as hr leaders you really need to be reaching out and confirming with your partners which checks that they are conducting for you use automation and digital digitized records or digitized records and gain assurances that their processes and systems that they're using have been designed to comply with the act and also any analogous privacy principles 
Now, the key things to look out for are how does your partner help you to provide notice of processing to individuals? How can they help you collect consent? How does that partner help you to handle individual rights requests? That could be things like accessing copies of their reports. And how will that partner support you if there are any, heaven forbid, data breach incidents? They're all critical components that are always to be built into platforms that those background screening companies utilize to deliver services to you. But getting into the real nitty gritty of the screening itself, how will the act impact us? Now, it's certainly true, as we've mentioned time and again throughout this, this webinar, that not all records in India are digitized at the moment. But the implementation of the Act is setting a clear intention that this really is the future of record keeping. And it's clearly steering organisations to a place where they move to put records online. And that, of course, inevitably has an impact on screening organisations who will need to prepare to comply with the Act dependent on what type of data is being processed. As we've mentioned, we're already seeing official sources digitising their records and making them accessible. But we're also seeing that movement in respect to how information can be accessed with sources requiring access via APIs designed to increase data security and make that data access less of a free for all. And again, that's where the automation provisions come in incredibly handy in this new act because we know how to comply. Now, this segues into a really critical part of the act and an area that every HR professional does need to pay careful attention to. And that is what constitutes a lawful ground to process data. As we said, it's not a free for all anymore. Now, the new act is pretty clear and you can process an individual's personal data. And this is a quote for a lawful purpose, which means any purpose if it's not prohibited by law, if the individual has given or is deemed to have given their consent. So looking at straightforward consent first, as I say, it's straightforward. It's got to be freely given, specific, informed, and has to include an unambiguous indication of that individual's wishes by which they, by a clear affirmative action, signify agreement to the processing of their personal data for the specified purpose. That's a very fancy way of saying, collect somebody's signature and provide an information notice, or you can have a checkbox. So, so far, so good. However, the Act also covers something called Dean Consent. And it's here that it introduces a little bit of complexity and a little bit of nuance. And that's because Dean Consent actually covers three specific items, all of which could be said to be quite pertinent to, to the background screening process. So the first is the public interest, including information held in the public domain and credit scoring. The second is a fair and reasonable purpose. That's something that if anyone's uh, familiar with GDPR is legitimate interest. And then, beautifully, purposes related to employment, which includes recruitment. So this seems much better, right? So on the face of it, we've got carte blanche to process data related to employment, including recruitment. So that means background screening. However, before we get too excited, the text of the Act also includes a really important concept. And that is that consent is only deemed to be given if the processing is necessary. Now, again, let's simplify this. What that actually means is that HR leaders need to really start to review the components present in their background screening programs and make assessments as to whether those components align with either specific regulatory requirements for certain sector verticals, for example, financial services, where you have to be screened to a certain level to hold a certain role, or where it's not so straightforward or clear cut, whether the components in your program actually align to the risks associated with the role that the candidate's applying for. That essentially means we might start to see a slightly more nuanced approach within programs with more intrusive checks potentially being run on more senior or high risk roles, as opposed to across all roles, which may start to utilize for those generic roles, more database checks initially for the lower risks, and then where those, those database checks flag issues, again, running those more intrusive checks. And when we say intrusive, we mean things like credit criminal checks. Now, as a side note, any program including credit checks may need a slight review just to determine which deem, deem consent limb we're going to rely on. So if you're running a program where you have a credit score returned, that might be something just to call out in an information notice. Now, I could talk about this for a really long time, but I won't. I'll save you all of that. But I think to sum up, um, the Act at its heart really encourages digitization of records and governs automated processes. And it's hugely impactful to background screening, and I would argue also hugely beneficial. Automation and digitization delivers not only a reduction in paperwork and manual processes, 
but also enhances data security and increases accuracy. And as we've said many times throughout, speed and accuracy really are the cornerstones of a strong background screening program. So working with screening companies that already have this in their DNA takes away at least one item on your to-do list. And companies, um, as they strive in the next 10 months or so to project manage compliance with the new law, can be more comforted if they're partnering with the background screening partner that actually has this in their DNA. That partner should give you a well-defined process that's backed by automation, ensuring a transparent audit trail to support all of your decision-making processes and regulatory compliance. And that is going to make it much easier for you to demonstrate to regulators that you've taken all this new legislation into account in your screening programs and then properly mitigated all of those associated risks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline, for sharing that very comprehensive outlook and if demystifying this act really at the end of the day i felt like um, you know it's very important for us to know the nuances of, of what is deemed consent and how it can probably play a role even in your audit trail uh, for that matter so thank you so much for sharing that so before uh, we go on to um, our audience questions we're getting a number of questions already uh, so that's very exciting to see i want to ask all of you all the three of you um, you know, maybe what are your key takeaways for attendees? What are the one or two things that you think they should uh, remember as we close this conversation? Huyen, can we start this, start this with you? Sure, Jerry. I think uh, we've shared quite a bit of information today. Uh, we've covered some of the key trends uh, as well as what are some of the benefits and opportunities for uh, HR leaders and HR practitioners uh, to be able to leverage uh, um, today, right? So I think for me, uh, the key takeaways from today's uh, webinar is really regarding the use of automation and digitization in background screening. I think it is uh, extremely critical now for HR leaders to reevaluate and consider what are their current background screening practices, right? And how will that also affect their selection criteria when they look to work with a background screening partner? With digitization that is happening, uh, it is definitely enabling us uh, to align more closely to the changes that is sweeping through the compliance landscape right now. And that is definitely one key consideration that companies should look into. And I think HR leaders should definitely uh, look at how automation is being leveraged in their current screening process and then discuss the strategy with their current screening provider and uh, explore uh, also the possibilities of uh, working with other providers if uh, what they have from the current vendor is not uh, giving them the assurance that they need in, a, in an evolving landscape. Absolutely. Samrat? Uh, Samrat, you're on mute. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I think for me, someone who's like responsible for, you know, fulfillment and, you know, process enhancement and process improvement. I think for me, one of the key takeaways is, uh, you know, for any employer or HR leader, when they're choosing, you know, a background screening partner, you know, you should look at both the aspects of, you know, how the turnaround time is, you know, in terms of, the accuracy of the checks, uh, then, you know, from a compliance perspective as well, you know, how compliant are all the processes, right? Uh, and how the background screening partner is able to give you, as I have, you know, mentioned earlier as well, that, you know, it's not just the speed that's important, it's the precision as well. So that you, I mean, for me, the way I look at it is, you know, a company or an HR leader, uh, outsources the background screening or chooses a partner for background screening with a lot of trust on that partner right so when you're you know choosing or you know for me the biggest takeaway is always make sure that you know you have a partner who's you know good on tat and at the same time has really really high accuracy 
fantastic. Caroline, can we have your thoughts? Yeah, so as obviously a, a sort of legal obsessive, um, for me, the key takeaway is the new um, act and just how impactful that's going to be on background screening with its focus on digitization and automation. And it, the reason it's so beneficial and, and so impactful is because essentially it's going to accelerate the speed and accuracy of any background screening program as we move to digitize and automate um, the retrieval and processing of records. Now, what that in effect does is remove the friction that candidates might otherwise feel in a more manual screening process. Um, and so the whole the whole uh, process will be much more easy, easeful for your talent um, and ultimately means that the individuals can be hired much more quite swiftly. And that's absolutely a win win for the hiring entity and, of course, the candidate and helps you win um, as a HR leader the war on talent because that process is so much more easeful. Absolutely. So thank you so much, um, all three of you. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, it's not just the evolution of technology, but also the evolution of law and also um, all of these practices impacting candidate experience. And I think all of these three, three things need to uh, come together for you to really make an impact um, on the speed, on the quality of your process. So we'll jump into the audience questions right now. And I can see that some of these questions uh, we have already reflected on to a certain extent. So I'll pick on some some questions that uh, that that, you know, probably we haven't touched. Um, I, there's this question on EPFO um, records and um, I want maybe Samrat, you can weigh in on this. EPFO records may not be available for many cases. Uh, for example, employees working with a firm uh, with less than 10, 20 employees, and maybe they didn't have, they, they were not eligible for EPFO, um, or they were self-employed. In such situations, how can we uh, track the past employer of the candidate and ensure that we have a robust process? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty interesting question, Jerry. Uh, you know, not only this, there's there's more scenarios as well where you know EPFO may not be there, especially if you know, your salary is below a certain uh, level, you know, even then as a, you know, employee, you will not have an EPFO account, right? So, you know, as, as Caroline had touched upon this earlier, I think the PF validation or the EPFO validation comes into play more when we are looking at really somebody doing moonlighting, right? If it's dual employment, the conventional way or the right way of doing an employment validation is always going back to the old company or you know the ex-employer reaching out to the HR or to the right person in that company and validating the records uh, you know that the applicant has given us right only in a scenario where uh, you know we don't get uh, the employer to respond or you know for some reason if the company has shut down we look at pf but the actual way of doing employment verification is always going back to the previous employer and you know uh, validating the records or the details given by the applicant in cases of self-employment right that's another interesting question right or interesting aspect that comes into play right when when you have to validate someone's self-employment i think there, you know, a lot of other things come into play, things like, you know, the Form 16 validation or things like, you know, uh, the bank account statement validation. I think these are the things that help in terms of, you know, if somebody was doing a self-employment because natural, uh, you know, if someone has their own firm, they would not have a uh, PF or a freelancer, right? So that's, that's what, uh, you know, that's how, uh, you know, we really look at doing background checks or employment verification for someone who's self-employment or if somebody does not have uh you know a pf number right 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 so those are some useful workarounds um to really get the information that you're seeking i think that's those are great examples samrat um so there's a question on um commonly used technologies but i i think maybe we can share uh a some examples, right? So um, maybe Caroline, if you could share some examples where automation has successfully mitigated discrepancies and improved the overall um, quality of the candidate information, uh, could you share your probably Hui Yan? Yeah. Um, so, so I think there's, there's there's lots of technologies out there that, that can be utilized. 
Um, so we mentioned um, uh, NLP um, and um, using AI in relation to name matching. Now, names, especially in APAC and India, can be quite complex, especially um, due to the fact that the your full name is not always present on um, for example, your, whichever ID document you might have submitted. And of course, we use name and ID as, as, as matching. So if we just took that as a very manual process, essentially what you're looking at is actually a lot of false discrepancies. So what we're trying to do is use NLP, um, lots of AI to basically generate programs that give a high probability of a name match based on what's been, been, been uh, submitted on forms or information coming back from a source versus what's actually on your ID card. And by utilizing that type of technology, we're actually able to give much more accurate and better results. And of course, it removes human error when you're using um, those technologies. And it's explainable to a candidate or, or even internally in HR that, you know, you, you know, we would never, for example, report anything under around a 90 to 85 percent probability of a name match. Now, if somebody says, well, that th that's not my record, you can defend that by saying, hey, we've used technology here. This is this is the probability of match. We can always rerun things. But I think it's, it's super powerful to use those types of technologies to really drive that accuracy through. Um, absolutely. Okay, so uh, there's a question and, and um, Sumrat, uh, you can let me know if that's something that we want to answer. Um, there's a question on Aadhaar and uh, the restrictions around it and how it can be used uh, for background screening. Uh, and could you weigh in your thoughts on this? Like, um, what are the kind of restrictions for third party use and and maybe how is the regulation evolving around this? Yeah, I think, uh, Jerry, on the Aadhaar piece, it's, it's still evolving, right? I mean, there are still, I'm sure, some percentage of the population, you know, that it's that still does not have an other they the people are still reg uh, registering and uh you know government is still taking a lot of uh, initiatives in terms of uh you know getting this data together right so right now i think when it comes to aadhar we are looking at uh you know it's it's not very elaborate uh, i don't think there's a lot of background checks that can be done just basis aadhar like for example you know we don't have educational institutes really, uh, you know, uh, take like maintaining Aadhaar data, right? And unlike some of the other countries where ID document is also maintained. And sometimes, you know, the educational certificate has an ID number attached to it. Right now, the education verification is in India, the when you, when you do an education verification, it's just the roll number that comes, you know, and, and there's nothing related to Aadhaar or any unique identity uh, number. So I think India is still, you know, I mean, there's still a lot of work going on. It's and it's pretty premature to comment at this point of time that uh, you know how we are going to have Aadhaar, uh, you know, integrated and connected with like anything and any kind of verification that we want to do in future. Absolutely, uh, Caroline, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Yeah, I, the, the, back in 2018, 2019, there was an awful lot of back and forth um, through the courts around the use of Aadhaar um, cards, um, you know, to prove your identity or for KYC purposes. Um, and you, the, the sort of court sort of landed in a position where, and um, provided the use of the Aadhaar card is, is purely voluntary, you can, for example, um, use it as your ID. So for example, as a piece of ID in, in a screening process. However, I think what's super important is, of course, it, it's, it's how do you make that voluntary? And again, we've talked a lot about privacy by design. So essentially, if somebody's coming through a process and they're needing to upload to form of ID, you have to give individuals choice. You don't mandate the Aadhaar. And it might not be the first choice on the list because sometimes we can be a little bit trigger happy and go, well, that's easy. I'll go Aadhaar first. So it's about making sure that you analyze which of those pieces of ID are the most acceptable 
down to the sort of one that, that carries, you know, slightly more, more nuance around it. And then again, that allows that candidate to make a voluntary disclosure of the Adhar card and thus kind of align with, with sort of where the courts ended up around the sort of 2019 mark. So hopefully that, that helps as well, just in, in terms of how processes can also help mitigate any risks of sharing the Adhar card. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that, Caroline. Uh, so we'll do a quick time check. I think we this is about the time that we have right now, but I know we have a bunch of questions and answered. We encourage you to send your questions to us. Uh, we will take them and direct uh, it to our speakers and uh, they can share more information over offline um, and we can continue the conversations and we'll be very happy to hear your thoughts as well. I want to thank Huyen, Caroline and Samrat for really taking the time and sharing not just perspectives from India and higher rights research, but really global perspectives and some of the best practices uh, that uh, you can bring in this background screening process. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, stay tuned for more such exciting sessions. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.